Hi, everyone. Welcome. Um, I think we still have a few people trickling in. Can everyone hear me okay? Can you just add in the chat if you can hear me okay? Oh, chat is disabled. Okay, thank you for letting me know, Anne. So it looks like um, if you have any questions or anything, if you could add, add them to the question and answer uh, function. Let me see if I can fix. Not working for me. Okay. Um, we'll just go ahead. If you have any questions, add them to the chat. I mean, to the question and answer, not to the chat. Um, thanks for letting me know that you can hear me. I appreciate that. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started. Looks like we have quite a few people here who have joined. Um, so before we get started, I did want to be patient with me here as I try to navigate this. <laughs> I kind of wanted to have an idea of, of who is with us here today um, and what your experience with Passport is. So if you wouldn't mind, um, I'm going to add a poll. Um, if you wouldn't mind responding to that, it kind of gives me a better idea of what to, um, what to expect from, from the participants that are here today. So starting out, I'm gonna go ahead and launch this question. Um, see if you can respond to it. What's your experience working with Passport? Are you a newbie? Um, you have no experience with Passport at all. You're here to basically learn everything top to bottom about the program. Um, or are you somebody who's comfortable with the program and you're here basically to get a little bit, you know, get a refresher? Um, or are you a seasoned expert? Are you the one that people go to in your office? Um, you know, when they have questions about Passport. Love to see where we are. So it looks like we have quite a few newbies. Just a couple more seconds on this. Yeah, I had a feeling we were going to be, um, we had we had quite a few new people. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and get started. Um, share the results here. So you can see 52% of our participants are brand new to the program. Um, and 35% know their way around. And then we have 13% who are seasoned experts. Um, know newbies that the people that are here today are, um, you know, lean on them, lean on us, because they they truly have, you know, been in the trenches, they've been working with the program, um, and they can they can help you oftentimes figure out uh, what to do when you run into something um, that might be a little bit challenging. So I'm going to go ahead and close this. Um, my second poll is, um, I want to have an understanding of what your role is. So I'm going to launch this poll. Are you a financial aid administrator that's not the passport designee? Um, are you the designated passport financial aid administrator? Are you the designated support staff on your campus? Are you a passport campus leader, um, social service provider or case manager for students? Or are you a contracted partner or other partner um, that works with WASAC? Again, just trying to get a little bit of an understanding. So it looks like we have lots of non-passport designated financial aid administrators. Um, lots of financial aid administrators that are working with passport students, um, some support staff, and then campus partners. I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll. 
and share the results here with you. Um, so yeah, thank you for being here with us today. And I am going to move on. So I just wanted to say hello and welcome. Um, you're currently viewing the Passport to Career Spring 2023 Financial Aid Workshop. I am Dawn Cipriano McCafferty, and I have the pleasure of serving as the Passport um, to Careers um, Assistant Director. Uh, this session is being recorded, and to reduce background noise, everyone is muted. But if you have a question, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question, or you can go ahead and type it into the uh, question and answer tool on the um, within Zoom. Nicole Fry, who's the Passport Program Coordinator, will be monitoring the, the question and answer function. Um, and I'll also uh, pause throughout the presentation to see if there's any questions that I can answer along the way. With that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Oops. So our, object, our objectives for today is basically to gain an understanding of the program um, and the whole support network that comes around with that wraps around Passport, um, understand how the portal works and how it can help with your functionality, um, provides information about resources available to administrators, students, and supporters, and then provides an opportunity for institutions to ask questions. So um, this slide just shows you some of the things that students have said, and I'm, I'm not gonna read them to you. I'm gonna give you an opportunity to look at them, but I wanna give you some background information on, on, on um, where we got this information. So we recently had Passport students complete a survey about their experience with the program and, um, and the support services that, that they receive. Now this slide shows you some of the feedback that we received directly from the students, and this is, very new. Um, we haven't even closed the survey. So um, some of the findings were was that, uh, let's see, 69% of the students that received support from Passport institutional staff, um, they said that it was either moderately or critically important for their college success. 80% uh, of the students indicated that Passport scholarships support and support helped them persist in college. And then 68% said that financial aid covered their expenses for college. 58% uh, said that they would continue their college enrollment next year, and 12% said that they were still undecided about that. Um, it looks like the most requested help was in financial aid, uh, covering tuition and fees. Uh, a lot of students needed help with groceries and food, uh, housing, and then academic advising. In 2018, the Passport program was expanded pretty significantly to serve a much broader population of students. As you can see, in order to be eligible for Passport, students um, must have experienced either state, tribal, um, ICPC, which is the interstate compact of the placement of children, um, foster care, or federal foster care at any point after age 13. Uh, students who experience unaccompanied homelessness on or after July 1st of the prior academic year are also eligible. And then students may participate in, in one of two pathways. They can either um, go to college and be part of the Passport to College program, or they can participate in an apprenticeship or pre-apprenticeship program and be part of the Passport to Apprenticeship Opportunities program. So prior to the expansion, eligibility for Passport was narrow and, and really limited the number of students that were supported. Um, a year or so before the expansion happened, uh, House Bill 6274 challenged Washington to become number one in the nation for foster youth high school graduation, post-secondary post -secondary enrollment, and post-secondary completion. Uh, what we knew was that Washington State couldn't move the needle on this, um, with that very narrow population of students that were eligible for Passport at that time. So that's one of the um, factors that um, led to expanding the program. 
So aside from what I had mentioned on the previous slide, uh, this is a little bit more detail about um, basic criteria for, pa for passport participation. So student needs to complete the FAFSA or WASFA. They um, obviously need to attend an approved institution in Washington at least half time. They do need to be a Washington state resident, um, make satisfactory acad academic progress toward their degree. Uh, they do need to enroll in college prior to age 22. And a student has uh, 15 quarters of eligibility or up to age, um, up through age 26 to be eligible for passport. Um, and also because of the separation of church and state in Washington state, a student may not pursue a degree in theology. So this slide provides you with information about the funds that are allocated to passport through the legislature. In 2023, the program was allocated an additional uh, $150,000 for a program study. So this is all very new. Um, so WASAC has anticipated contracting this work through an independent research team, and um, there will be a report due um, to the legislature in 2024. And I don't know the details of, uh, of what to expect from the research team or what's gonna be happening. What I can tell you is come July 1st, we're gonna hit the ground running um, and we, need, we really need, need to get this uh, done in order to be able to provide that report to the legislature in 2024. Um, I do also anticipate that institutions may be contacted for information about what's happening. Um, what I know about that is very limited at this time, but as soon as I get more information, I will be communicating that with you so that you're prepared um, in case you are contacted by the research institution. So as I mentioned before, the program has expanded significantly in a relatively short period of time. Um, so now students could have been in various types of foster care um, for, at, for any point of time um, after the 13th birthday, or they could have experienced unaccompanied homelessness, like I, like I explained earlier. Um, now, the reason for this slide is to basically show how much the program has grown in just a, a few short years. Um, and what I know is how much more work it has uh, put on your plate. I understand that the commitment you've made to these students um, and, and I just want to take a minute to really share my gratitude for, for providing students with these services. Um, you can see the 2022-23 information that's listed here. It's academic year is not over, so I expect that this number could even increase a little bit more by the time this year is over. <clears throat> Again, looking at passport by the numbers, um, this slide shows you the dollars that have been committed to students um, and the fiscal investment that that has been made into the passport program. As you can see from the information here on the slide, you can uh, both the funds to students and institutions has steadily increased since the 2017 2018 academic year. Okay, at this point, I'm going to pause and see if there's any questions, Nicole. I, I can't see the question and answer. Is there anything there? Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the data sharing and the portal. Oops. Uh, as you know, WASAC has had a comprehensive data sharing agreement with um, the Department of Children and Children, Youth and Families for several years. Uh, this data sharing agreement allows us to receive foster youth verification directly from the source, directly from DCYF, and virtually eliminate the need for students to prove their experience with the state foster care system. Um, through this data sharing agreement, youth that were part of the state foster care system are essentially auto-enrolled in the, into the passport program. 
um, we have found that over the past several years uh, that through this auto enroll, students are in our system much more efficiently. However, one of the drawbacks is that they're not necessarily aware of the passport program and how it uh, provides the support to them. So students are sent an email notifying them of their eligibility and program details from WASAC, but we're learning that students don't necessarily read email. So we're trying to dig in and do um, some work with the passport leadership team and how we can more effectively provide program information to students and their supportive adults. Uh, now, looking at the WASAC and OSPI um, data sharing agreement, we've worked together and developed a data sharing agreement for students who've experienced unaccompanied homelessness in their senior year of high school. So similar to the verification that DCYF provides, um, we're hoping that this information from OSPI can help reduce the burden of proof <clears throat> on the student and the financial aid administrators. Um, as you may be aware, when we develop agreements, we also need to be able to receive the data, which um, will require some work from the WASAC IT team. This work is currently in the queue with IT, and I'm hoping to see some progress in the, in the upcoming year. So this here is a screenshot of um, the, the secure messaging function on the portal. And it's just intended as a reminder to use the secure messaging function on the portal anytime you're dealing with um, wanting to communicate something that could include personally identifiable information to WASAC. Um, this tool is very easy to use and can be found in the common um, dropdown section of the portal. You can see right here, um, you, can, you click on common and then you go to messages and files and then you go to your inbox. Um, from here, you're going to, you see I have it numbered one, two, three, four, um, and then five, you finally send the message. So you can go ahead and, um, and play with that also in the training function, um, portal training uh, tool that's available to you as well. So uh, passport eligibility. Uh, several years ago, we tightened up some of the security on the passport eligibility search. Um, and, and we've also heard from institutions that they wanted to have like a bulk upload. So we have implemented this. It is available to students or to institutions. Um, essentially what you do is you enter the student's date of birth and either their last name or their last four digits or their social security number. Um, I did want to let you know that if you don't do that fully, then you, you will not have any results that come back to you. Um, again, like I said a little bit earlier, you can now also do a bulk upload. You can upload a file um, of students and that should hopefully help you um, get to a, a bigger list of students that will help you award more effect, uh, effect, effectively. This slide shows you essentially what is uh, what is displayed in the portal. Um, if a student is eligible, a green check mark right here will appear under the eligible column. Um, occasionally, you see the word um, overridden yes, and that means basically that there was a change to the student's original status. Um, sometimes you'll see um, like pending or they're like in a pending status. And if that happens, send me a message and we'll go ahead and uh, follow up with DCYF to see if we can get a little bit more information from them and, and get some, uh, get their status changed in the portal. Um, the classification column uh, identifies a student type of foster care. So you can see the types here. Um, and there are four different categories. You know, SFY is state foster youth, URM is unaccompanied refugee minor, TRB is tribal foster youth, and UHY is unaccompanied homeless youth. Um, you can also see in other slides, you can see um, the quarters of eligibility remaining. You can also uh, find out if you click on the, there's like a little circle with an eye in it, you can find out a little bit more information 
about um, what's going on with that student and maybe who awarded the student. So most times, passport eligibility for unaccompanied homeless youth are, it's determined by the financial aid office. Um, to document a student's status in the portal, the financial aid administrator enters the student's name into, to, into the eligibility checker and then clicks on, there's a UHY link um, to the right of the page. And they can click on that. Um, and then this slide is showing that you can also cancel a student's UHY status. Um, so if you are working with a student, maybe there was a gap in enrollment and the student was able to secure housing or their status changed, and you're seeing that the student's not necessarily qualifying for passport anymore as an un unaccompanied homeless youth, you can click on that cancel UHY button. It provides you um, with that pop-up that you see on the screen right here. And we get a message on our side. Oftentimes we also follow up with the institutions because a lot of times what's happened is the administrator may accidentally push this button. And so we'll we'll send a message and say, you know, I just want to confirm that the student status has changed and we need to we need to adjust it in the portal. Um, also, there's been some recent federal guidance on um, verifying a student's um, status as, as an unaccompanied homeless youth or as a homeless youth. And um, I have included the new language in the passport program manual um, and a link to the dear colleague letter that was um, that was put out to provide a little bit more guidance. One second. Okay. Just moving on to forms. Uh, this form might be familiar to you. This is the passport consent form. Um, this is for students who have experienced federal or tribal foster, federal or tribal foster, um, state dependents, federal refugees or tribal dependents also need to fill out this form. Unaccompanied homeless youth do not fill out this form. Um, they can also submit their consent by uh, indicating that they were in foster care on their FAFSA. So we, we do take that information and, and bump it against the information that we get from, from DCYF. Um, the form helps us also understand what organization, WASAC, what we need to do to verify the student's eligibility. So do we need to, you know, contact one of the um, one of the tribes, or do we need to, you know, be in contact with um, DSHS, who oversees the uh, federal foster youth program? Um, and then with this, let's see. So, so tribal foster youth do need to complete the consent form, and in addition to the consent form, we ask that they fill out a tribal verification form. So. Young people have had their foster care established by a tribal court. They also need to complete this tribal verification form. Um, unfortunately, we do not have a data sharing agreement with the 29 federally recognized tribes. Um, so the student, student needs to complete the top half of this form and then have their case manager or social worker at the tribe um, complete the bottom half and then send it into WASAC. And then we'll go ahead and get them updated into the portal. Uh, the housing questionnaire is provided to institutions and students to help determine passport eligibility as an unaccompanied homeless youth. So please consider this as a, this form as a as a resource. Uh, you don't need to use it, but it is available to you if you if you need it, and you need to document the student's file um, for their status. Uh, although most times the unaccompanied homeless youth will have their passport eligibility determined by the financial aid administrator. Um, in extenuating circumstances, the student may be referred to WASAC. So you can refer a student to WASAC um, for us to do their eligibility determination. Um, also, as a side note, for the most part, a student's passport status will not change. However, like I had mentioned earlier, if there is a gap in enrollment aside from summer term, um, the financial aid administrator may reevaluate the student's housing circumstance and their eligibility could change. So identifying eligible 
eligible students. Um, this is all, this is a question that I get asked probably the most frequently. Like, how do I find the students on my campus? Um, how do I know who's eligible for passport on my campus? How do I do? Uh, how do I um, provide them with outreach? You know, what do I do? So, admittedly, there is no perfect way, but there are several things that can be done to help. Um, first of all, you um, can receive a list of students from WASAC who have been determined eligible for passport and listed your institution on their FAFSA or WASFA as an institution that they, they're interested in attending. Um, I typically have the list sent like late in the summer, early in the fall, so that you know financial aid administrators know who their students are um, and they can do outreach. It's just kind of intended as like a cleanup. Um, however, please know that you can request this information and this list from us at any time. And Nicole and I are always happy to get it to you. It's a really easy list to pull. So we can always um, get that to you in a matter of minutes. Um, you can also take a look at admissions or registration materials to see who's indicated experience with the foster care system or, home, or um, has experienced unaccompanied homelessness. Uh, sometimes either the student or their supportive adult might just come right out and say like, hey, this is something that's going on with the student. So listen to that um, when, you're, when you're working with the parents or um, supportive adults for the students. See, you know, see if you're hearing anything about you know, that might make them eligible for passport or, or that where you might see that they qualify for the program. And then finally, many of these students are working with organizations um, and are involved in programs such as Setup, which uh, I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, and I encourage you to reach out to these organi organizations to help with uh, recruitment and to gain an understanding of who could potentially be served as a passport student. So we're going to just go ahead and talk about some reminders and um, upcoming things that are that are expected in the in the next 12 months or so. So I love this picture. This is a picture that was taken at our passport conference in May. And um, this was our this was our student panel and they did a fantastic job. Um, and I just, I love this picture. It again, you know, reminds me of the why we do the work that we're doing. And I just wanted to share that with you. Take a minute to, to share that. Um, so some program reminders. Uh, administrators are asked to request funding each quarter. Please don't wait till the end of the year and request funds for the whole, for the whole um, year. It does really mess with our fund management process. Um, so please try not to delay your payment requests. Um, I also wanted to remind you that foster youth still receive a priority for state work study funding. Um, also, the program manual last year, I expanded it to include a section for designated support staff. So any of the support staff that are working with students on campus, there's a section in the program manual for you. Um, and then I wanted to mention this, Becky brought this up in, um, in the in-person trainings. And I know that this has been mentioned in this uh, Washington College grant trainings, but um, there's this difference between late and retroactive payments. Um, so first of all, a retroactive payment occurs when a student completes their financial aid application late, but previously enrolled or is currently attending. Um, the financial aid application is under review by the institution and occurs after a term has passed. So that's Retroactive, that's the definition of it. Um, retroactive awards and or payments must be made for all programs, um, for example, Washington College Grant, College Bound and Passport, for which a student is eligible for a prior term as long as they are um, for the current year and other program rules are followed. Now, late awards, um, the definition for that is, uh, let's see, late awards occur when an institution awards Washington College Grant um, and pass and does not award passport or other WASAC state aid programs at the same time. So it's imperative that all awards are entered into the WASAC portal at the same time. Institutions not awarding programs at the same time are considered to be out of compliance and WASAC does monitor institutions for late awarding practices. So if they're awarding late 
um, then the student is still eligible for a maximum award, even if they, um, if they, it, their award should be based on what it was at the beginning of the term. So if they reduce their court, their, um, their credits, then it, sh it should still be awarded for what the student was uh, enrolled in for the beginning of the, of the quarter. So the passport agreement, um, the passport, there's an addendum to the regular participation agreements for state financial aid programs with WASAC. Um, and that addendum is specific to passport. Um, and in the agreement, uh, we basically ask institutions to provide individualized support services to passport students. Um, there are currently about 45 institutions that have developed this um, a viable student support plan for passport students through uh, making a commitment through their leadership, uh, designating a passport support staff person. This is the DSS. We mention this all the time. Um, and then we ask that financial aid administrators review the student's financial aid, ensuring that all resources are utilized and that there's a minimal reliance on student loans. And then, um, like I had mentioned earlier, connecting with the social service providers, independent living providers, set up providers, working with them so that um, we can ensure that the students transition from high school and into um, a post-secondary institution is as seamless as possible. Um, I did wanna mention that the current agree the agreements that are in place, they expire at the end of June, 2024. And so I expect to be sending out new agreements um, in the spring of 2024. A uh, little bit more about the agreement. Um, the addendum, like I said, is due July 1st, 2024. We ask that institutions take a look at their um, student support plan, so their viable student support plan that they've developed, and that would be due in September. We always give institutions a little bit more time to really think about what needs to be done and um, to, you know, make the changes, make the updates to the, to the support plan. I also wanted to mention that the student support plan is an institutional document. document. It's something that should be used, um, should be used to help support the students on your campus, help you as administrators navigate, um, navigate your campus and, and work with um, the designated support staff, financial aid staff, um, to help students uh, overcome the barriers barriers that they might be experiencing. Um, so we ask institutions to review it on an annual basis, and then we ask them to submit it to us every two years. About a year ago, we created a passport PCL as passport campus leader role description. So if you're if you are in a leadership position, you can take a look at that. And this is the this is what I like to call my Oprah list. You know, it's like if I were Oprah and I could make changes to whatever it was in the world, this is what we would want the passport campus leader to to know and understand and and how to work through the passport program. Um, we also have a role description for the financial aid administrator and the designated support staff. Now I understand that what's in the role description may not quite fit into what you currently do. Um, but it at least will give you some ideas as to, you know, what we would hope, um, how, how that person in that role would be working to support students. I also wanted to put a little plug in here. If you're not currently a passport participating institution with a viable plan and a signed agreement and your passport campus leader and DSS, um, we, again, if this were my world, um, every campus would have some would have this in place. Uh, I also understand that it could be a little bit daunting, and so I wanted to provide just some some uh, provide an offer of support um, between the College Success Foundation and myself. We're always happy to help you navigate the process if this is something that you're interested in doing. Um, you know, we we usually use models from other institutions. And um, you know we can help you develop your plan if it is something that you're interested in doing.
as part of the um, addendum and the student support funds that are sent to institutions, we ask institutions to do to provide a report annually. Um, and basically, what we're trying to figure out is, you know, how the funds were used. If they weren't used, then how are you planning on using them the next year? Um, what kind of support was provided to students? And then um, if you're curious about this, you can take a look at the Passport Program Manual um, because I have copied um, the list of questions and I put them in the program manual. So you have an idea of what is um, being asked. The questions that are asked are actually vetted through the Passport um, leadership team and uh, the, data work, the data work group. Uh, I also wanted to mention that because there are some components of this report that are financial aid specific and some that are student support specific, I would recommend that the financial aid administrator and the passport designated support staff work together on completing the report. Um, that will not be due until August. I'm sending it out early August um, with a deadline at the end of August. So what other sources of support are available to Passport students? Um, first and foremost, the Passport Student Support Funds, which are paid out at $500 per student per quarter. Um, that's for the recruitment and retention of Passport students and helps them overcome barriers. It's, we found that it's critical to helping students overcome their barriers um, to their educational success. Um, WASAC also reaches out to students through email. Um, and then we've also tried to use the Otterbat Otterbot texting campaign to do some outreach. Um, and then we do an annual survey like I had mentioned earlier today as well. Um, the College Success Foundation provides emergency funding through the Scholar Success Fund. And then Foster Love, um, which you may have, uh, you may be familiar with it. They used to be called Together We Rise. They are still providing rapid response emergency funding to foster youth, not to unaccompanied homeless youth, but to foster youth. You can always refer a student to them as well. So community partners and other resources. Um, the Passport Leadership Team is, is actually an advisory group. Um, it's made up of about 30 members and there's representatives from institutions, um, social services, state agencies. Um, uh, we have some representation from tribes, apprenticeships. So it's a whole variety of people that have some kind of influence on the passport program. Um, we do meet on a quarterly basis, and then we have three subgroups that meet much more frequently. Um, and those three subgroups, like I mentioned earlier, is the passport data work group, um, program infrastructure, and the passport um, advising structure. Um, some of the projects that we've done is, you know, we've created some regional groups to um, increase, increase the networking and support within certain regions of the state of Washington. Um, there's a lot of resource development that we, that's going on. We do, uh, they do policy advising. They help us with uh, program evaluation advising and also a lot of opportunities for training as well. So as I mentioned earlier, there are two pathways within Passport. Um, you're familiar with the Passport to College pass pathway, um, but the second pathway is the Passport to Apprenticeship Opportunities. Um, this program helps non-campus-based apprenticeship programs or registered free apprenticeships. Um, it helps students cover occupational costs such as tuition and fees, um, work clothes, rain gear, occupation-related tools, um, anything that could help a student overcome, again, their barriers to, to making progress in their apprenticeship program. Uh, WASAC does contract with ANU, which is an organization based in King County for program administration. And then this slide just provides you with some information about ANU. Um, they want people to be aware that an apprenticeship covers a broad spectrum of occupations, which includes manufacturing, construction, um, healthcare, IT, there's some barbering, bar barbering programs. Um, and this is offered throughout the whole state of Washington. 
Um, Hallie Schreiber is the person responsible for supporting passport, passport to apprenticeship students at ANU. Her contact information is on the slide. Um, I've mentioned the setup program a couple of times throughout this training. And what you may not know is that setup is, is part of the passport program and works with youth between the ages of 13 and 21 to help them prepare for college, career, or service. Um, the program is small and it serves about, it serves less than 300 young people each year. Um, and it's contracted out through five um, social service providers throughout the state of Washington. Uh, these organizations provide case management for things like admissions applications, um, career interest inventories, help with completing their FAFSA or WASPA, um, and assistance with college campus visits as well. Uh, you can find more information about the setup providers in the Passport Program Manual. We do have some contact information there and um, the organization listed as well. So this slide provides you with several resources that you might find helpful um, as you implement Passport on your campus. First of all, the Passport Program Manual. I've mentioned that several times throughout this presentation. We're currently um, finalizing the updates on the 23-24 um, Program Manual, so the newest one. I'm expecting that to be out within, within a couple of weeks. Um, I know we're just in the final stages of getting that updated. Um, also, the WASAC website has flyers that you can download and post on your wall or on your, your door, um, links to other resources for students. Um, there's actually a lot of resources listed on the WASAC website. Um, contact information for institutions with viable student support plans doing the similar work that you're doing. So if you get, again, stuck on something, you can always reach out to another institution and say like, hey, how are you navigating through this? What are you doing? How are you? Um, functioning in this in this process, or you can always reach out to us. Um, also, the Washington Passport Network website is a fantastic resource for practitioners and campus staff. Um, information listed there includes training resources, um, some information on the annual passport conference, role descriptions that I had mentioned earlier um, for campus staff serving passport students, and then guidance on how to use the support funds, the student support funds. Um, which is also something that we get um, we get lots of requests for. And last but not least, um, this is the WASAC program team. Um, I'm Dawn, Nicole is also online right now, and then Carla is our um, direct uh, supervisor. We're always happy to help. So anytime you have any questions or if you have any if you need any help navigating the system or awarding students or you know you have any questions, reach out to us and we're always happy to help you um, help you get answers to the questions that you might have. Um, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share and see if there are any questions in the, in the question and answer section. Okay, Cindy, I see that you asked up to what age is the student considered eligible for passport to careers? Can an independent student qualify if over 24 um, as they were at some after 13 year old? Okay, so I think what you're asking is, um, so if a student is eligible for passport, a student is eligible for passport if they were in foster care at any point after age 13. They do, however, need to enroll in college um, prior to age 22. So that's step one. Once they enroll in college, they have either 15 quarters of eligibility or um, it, up until age, up through age 26. So that, I hope that answers your question. Um, and then I see Cindy, you also asked, can you explain why students can lose eligibility if there's a broke, break in enrollment? Um, that is about basically, so a foster youth, their status doesn't change. They, if they were in foster care after age 13, then they were in foster care after age 13. For students who have experienced unaccompanied homelessness, their status could change. So they could secure housing. They could, um, they, there could be a change in their status. So if there's a break in enrollment, so they will be eligible for as long as they continue to enroll. If there's a break in enrollment, then it provides the, the institution, the financial aid office, 
to reevaluate that student's status. Are they still experiencing homelessness? Their status could have changed. So that's what that is about. Um, and then uh, Jocelyn is asking, I want to confirm that the passport to careers and the passport student support funds are different. Yes, you're correct. There's a scholarship that goes directly to the students. And then there's the student support funds that go to the institution. Um, the institution is able to make decisions on how that funding is spent. And the language around, or the parameters around um, that is it's actually pretty flexible. Um, and I'm happy to share more about that um, if you have any questions, if you have any questions about it. Um, there's also more information in the passport program manual as well. Okay, are there any other questions? 